Uh, 29 minutes left. I wanted to say I took a selfie with the piano before. I'm one of those people who cannot not play a piano if it's on stage. Um, it's not locked, but I also didn't play it. If you're watching the recording at home, that may or may not be true. Uh, so BGP and OSBF is what we all need in, uh, uh, in routers uh, to, uh, to perform well. And we typically buy Cisco's or Juniper's or Force 10's or whatever the new kids do. And then we, uh, we have fun, but they're very, uh, very expensive and they're not open source. Um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, some project that I did in the last uh, maybe two years to bring very high speed and high throughput routing to normal PCs, ARMS, or AMD64 uh, using DPDK and vector packet processing VPP. So first, a little bit about me. My name is Pim. I've been a member of the Ripe community for a while now. Ripe 34 was the first one I went to. Uh, I'm Dutch. I do sound American, but I'm, I'm not. And I have my uh, obligatory Swiss uh, uh, vanity domain because I moved to Switzerland in uh, 2006 or so. And during the pandemic, I got bored, so I incorporated a little company that does routing. So that is IPNG Networks, GmbH. Uh, we are a developer of software routers. Uh, uh, fully open source, so we don't do any uh, any binary blobs or uh, you know icky stuff. Uh, mostly based on uh, commodity hardware, as I'll as I'll show. Tiny, tiny operator from Brutisellen, which is not even known in Switzerland except for the traffic jams at Brutisellen. Grütz, jeden Tag. But we also have a ring in Europe, which maybe resonates a little bit more. We peer on the flap, except for us, the L is not London. It's a little town called Lille in the north of France. But you know, it counts. And we have about 1,850 or 1,900 adjacencies. Uh, you may have heard of my name from Six Access, a tunnel broker that I ran for about 20 years. They had an AS number with four digits, uh, which I thought was nice, gathering dust in the corner. So I took it over from the previous owner, and I'm now a proud owner of a vanity AS number. So first, a little bit about uh, DPDK. Uh, it's the data plane development kit originally uh, by uh, Intel uh, for their NICs, but in the, in the recent times, other vendors have as well added DBDK functionality. And what it really does is it tells the kernel to give us back the network card, so there is no more kernel routing. And you can use SRIOV or user-defined user, uh, IO and virtual functions to just directly talk to the network card in user space. And normally that's very counterintuitive because like the kernel is fast, but actually that's a, that's a lie. <coughs> So what happens then is DPDK starts a thread which pulls the NIC and asks it if there's work to do, and it runs 100% of the CPU uh, you know, on that one NIC. Uh, and then when packets are there to, uh, to handle, it runs them to completion, whatever you may want, like forwarding IPv4, or IPv6, or MPLS, or you know, what have you, and then emits them back on the other network card, right? So there are then uh, receive side scaling hardware options in most network cards that allow them to shift off traffic into receive queues that can be bound by different uh, CPUs. And then you might have a linear scaling, you know, if one CPU can do uh, 100,000 packets per second and you had 10 CPUs and 10 queues, you would do a million packets per second. Uh, as well, there's a lot of stuff that the, the NICs might uh, offload for you, like checksumming or uh, labels or VXLAN injection and, and all of that stuff. And so if you write a DPDK driver, uh, you can have the silicon do as much as it can and then hand over the resulting uh, packets in a buffer to user space for further uh, processing. So here in this picture, you see four cores that are listening to these uh, pull mode drivers that under them have the physical NICs and the Linux kernel there is just a pass through, like you're not using it uh, at all. So VPP is built on top of DPDK and other libraries. Really, DPDK is a very popular one, but there's others too. And instead of having each packet go through the kernel one by one, you know, you may have to do Ethernet input, some filtering. Maybe it was a, an ARP packet, so it has to go to like the ARP handler, or maybe it was uh, routed through me, so you have to do a route lookup and like figure out which interface and which next hop and all that other stuff. The kernels typically do this one by one. It's super, super inefficient. Uh, VPP uh, leverages DPDK by asking it for not one, but many packets, say 100 or 200 packets, and it creates a list of them, and then it has these tiny bubbles that you see in the graph here on this slide that are very small in code and will fit in your CPU's instruction cache. Uh, and so the first packet that goes through this may have to pull in from RAM these instructions into the iCache for the CPU, but the second through nth don't need to touch RAM at all. 
And in particular, if you use certain network cards and certain CPU architectures, you can ask the network card not to DMA the packet through the NIC into RAM, but just leave it in the CPU. So you never even touch RAM at all. Uh, TLDR, the CPU's caches are much, much faster, two, three orders of magnitude faster than RAM, and we think RAM is fast, but that's a lie. Um, so hardware offload, if you can have your silicon do one of these bubbles, you're happy to offload that back into hardware. For example, crypto with QAT, the quick assist from Intel, you might do all of the crypto decrypto serialization back in hardware again and then get the resulting you know, encrypted packets for marshalling on the wire. Uh, so if this exists, you, you can use that. And as a software engineer, you're allowed to add any code you'd like into this as a graph node that you insert uh, you know, between any one of these two bubbles in the graph. And that's kind of what I did to make it a little bit more useful because you don't have network cards anymore in the kernel, so you can't do ifconfig or IP link, they're gone. Instead, you have to run this control binary called VPP Cuddle, where you can set the interface state up and give it an MTU and set some IP addresses. This all sounds reasonably logical, of course, and then you can see traffic flowing uh, through this router. You just, just, there's nothing to TCP dump because there's no more interfaces in Linux, right? My machine is called Hippo uh, because it is always hungry for packets. Now, um, it's not useful to implement all of the routing control plane functionality directly in VPP. Like, I know running a BGP daemon is hard, but writing one is even harder. And there's a lot of really cool open source out there. So uh, a bunch of the folks in the community thought it might be nice to inject one of these new bubbles that can pick up packets that are destined for an IP address that you configured on the router. And instead of handling them in the data plane, using a TunTap tunnel to give them to the Linux kernel again. And so you create this TunTap interface in Linux for any given VPP device, and if a packet goes to the IP address configured on it, we'll punt it into the tunnel and the Linux kernel sees it again. That's super cool, because now you can do stuff with the packet, like reply the ICMP echo. Uh, and then on the way back, any packets that are inserted into this tap tunnel by the Linux kernel will be get picked up just as normal Ethernet frames that we found, and we marshal them just like any other inputs that we would have. And then there's two things that we do. One is, of course, you can configure the data plane with an IP address and whatever, but we would like that to show up as well on the Linux side, so we copy it forward and do the, sort of the same configuration on Linux. And in the other way around, if Linux wants to change any one of these interfaces, MTU, link states, routes on them, IP addresses, they will generate Netlink messages, which we pick up in VPP in this plugin, and then apply them sensibly to the data plane. So now we get our interfaces back, and we can use them just like any other normal interface, except the only traffic we're gonna see on them is traffic destined to the control plane. All the rest still goes through the machine super, super fast. Uh, for the curious, uh, the links will work. Uh, of course, don't work, you can't click on them here, but there is a seven part uh, article post on how this was designed, on like all the nitty gritty C stuff to implement this plugin. Uh, in both directions. And the last one is maybe the most relevant for practitioners. It's a how to install this thing on a cheap super micro uh, and just run it in production, fully productionized. So now instead of doing that VPP cuddle string that I had before, all we have to do is create what is called an LCP, a Linux control plane pair, that plums through 10 gig 300 and calls it XE0. And now we can manipulate the thing uh, as if it was a Linux interface. So we can set the IP address uh, and we can maybe create a sub-interface, VLAN 101, give it a name, you know, set some defaults on that, and ping quad nine, we're off to the races. All of this is then again on the Linux side. So I run a bunch of these in production. Uh, the top ones you may recall, the ASR9K, they're super cool, uh, except they're also very hot because they run like four kilowatts each. Uh, and uh, I connect them, you know, a whole set of these in that ring through one of these carrier networks. And you'll note, like this uh, guy at the top is uh, my carrier, and the one at the bottom there, uh, that, that's me. It's like a 1U machine that has six times 10 gigs and does line rate on all six interfaces, which is kind of nice. And as it does that, it'll consume 45 watts, not four kilowatts. So maybe the European Union can give me a grant for like saving world power. 
But as I said, like this stuff only goes through the data plane, right? So we won't see any of that traffic with normal tools like SNMP. And so I had to write an SNMP agent that will collect these numbers back from the data plane and report them up, you know, via uh, via LibreNMS, which is the thing that we use. But you know, any NMS would work really. And and you'll note that this thing is casually forwarding like 18 gigabits of traffic on a 700 euro machine. Pretty cool. But VPP is only a data plane that you can configure with APIs, and it doesn't come with any config persistence, and that's by design, and they won't change that. And so I wrote a thing called VPP config, which reads some YAML specification on how you would like the router to look like, and then computes all the API calls that we might need to set you know, the data plane up. And it tries to be smart uh, using a declarative sequencer with a directed graph that knows that you should like remove IP addresses before removing the interface or you know remove things from the bridge before destroying the bridge and the other way around as well. And I'll show you how that works in a little bit. I'm trying to get it upstreamed. Uh, it was a little bit hard because of employer issues, but we worked through them. And uh, I think I could put it in uh, VPP 2302, which uh, releases in uh, February of next year. So now I took a router in Plan Les Watts, which is in uh, uh, Geneva, and I dumped the config into a YAML file. I might edit that file and add some interfaces here. This looks pretty straightforward, I guess. Uh, I added two sub-interfaces there, cross-connected one of them, give the other an IP address, uh, kind of know the spiel. And then we can ask VPP config to plan a path from what it found in the data plane to what I specified instead, uh, and it will uh, output 22 lines of stuff that it would like to change, and this is the stuff that it would change in this case from what I had running on the router to what I had specified you know, in my config file. Uh, and then you ask it to apply that config and it computes all these RPCs and then injects them to the data plane and now the data plane looks like what you had configured. Uh, and we try with VPP config to make any state transition from any valid config safe without you know, crashes. If it does crash, let me know. So now we have data plane configured, but we still need to do something smart with the control plane, notably configure you know, BGP and OSPF and all that other stuff. And so I, I, I stole a thing from our friends in Holland uh, at ColoClue. They wrote a tool called Case. And Case just downloads a bunch of stuff from PeeringDB, thanks again for that, and hydrates up everything you need to know about a BGP session at a certain internet exchange. So all you really do is type the AS number you would like to find. It figures out what the filters are and what the max prefix and all that other stuff. And then it ends up just computing a, a set of configs, in my case, BIRD, that's the thing that we use uh, at, at IPNG, and then it copies them safely you know, to, the, uh, uh, to the data plane. So now, if I wanted to add, say, Hamburg Decix, how that would look like is I edit this file, and the only thing I do is refer to the peering DB IX number, which is number 74 in the case of uh, Decix Hamburg, uh, and then I will add a session to the Decix route servers and give it a certain BGP community, and then I would add three empty stanzas there for uh, Hurricane and I guess Amazon, and I don't know who that other guy is. Uh, and then the generator will run after I tell the router in Frankfurt that it is a part of this internet exchange by just giving it its local addresses on the peering LAN. I can generate now the entire config, which is a very long thing because this Frankfurt router has like a million internet exchanges it's connected to. Uh, but eventually, this is the relevant part, right? It figured out the IP addresses and all the other things that belong to these routers, and then it emits a fully formed uh, config file. So you could uh, consider this the same thing as what you might find in an Ansible playbook. Then I can push it to the router uh, and commit it GitOps style. And as soon as I push it, you can imagine this goes into a build system that distributes it to the, uh, to the router in question and just uh, tears, tears up the Decix Hamburg and uh, we're live. Uh, this thing works uh, pretty well. Uh, I don't have TCAM, so this is not a problem that we have in software-based routers. So easily carrying 11 million routes in the rib uh, and obviously full tables, that's, that's all just fine. And because this thing does uh, multicast and unicast uh, forwarding right from the data plane to Linux, it runs things like OSPF, uh, you know, just fine. Uh, it's really, really fast, though. This is something you won't find in the spec sheet of your Cisco or Juniper. Converges a full table in about seven seconds, and that includes programming the fib. Uh, vanity trace route that shows my ISP. Next. 
There is another really, really cool DPDK app, though, and it's called Cisco T-Rex. It's a load tester, and you can set it up to send certain traffic using APIs. It uses a Python library called Scapy that allows you to define what types of traffic you'd like, and then you assign it to ports and ramp up and down and sort of see the statistics. And the claim of my talk here is that I can do 100 million packets per second. I made that claim last year, uh, and then someone called me out on Twitter and said, I don't believe you, so I have to go prove it. All right, here we go. So T-Rex has a simple config file that you tell it some source and destination IP addresses in pairs of ports, right? The one port here, the purple one on the left, NIC0, is just emitting a bunch of traffic through this cloud called the device under test, and we're expecting that traffic back on the other side. So all packets that I've sent, I want to count again on the other side, and if not, they were somehow lost, right? So I can do this unidirectionally, or I can do this bidirectionally, where the light blue NIC1 is also sending traffic that I expect back on NIC0. Uh, you can run it in, in multiple modes, but the stateless mode is pretty straightforward. You give it either source address uh, as MAC or uh, source and destination address as NextHop, and it'll use ARP resolution to forward you know, the traffic. So you start one of these, and then you have this, uh, this sort of GUI, or not a GUI, like it's a text terminal user interface where you can type stuff on a CLI, and you can pull it on the API you know, as well. As I said, there's a bunch of traffic profiles that you might add uh, in Scapy. This one is an iMix. You know, it has certain source destination pairs that it can either do single flow or multiple flows, multiple types of traffic, inter packet gaps, spacing, and all that stuff is computed in Scapy. And then a stream of packets is created and applied to one or more ports. And then you set the port at a certain rate. For example, a one packet per second, or one percent of line rate, or 100 megabits of traffic, and then and T-Rex will start emitting that and counting it back on the other side. So I have two methods of load testing uh, at IPNG. Uh, one is a relatively easy saturation load test where you just send a bunch of traffic through the machine and see where it breaks, you know, and see if I have only one receive queue and only one CPU assigned uh, and one network card, like how much can I do? So you start with maybe 1,000 packets per second and then a million packets per second or 100 million packets per second, and you figure out when is the CPU giving up, right, because you will not see the traffic on the other side. And the second method is more like the RFC, whatever, 2455, the load testing RFC that just ramps traffic up from zero to 100% of line and expects it back on the other side. And it measures when the packet loss is greater than a tenth of a percent or so. So Clyde here is in my lab. There's a uh, controller uh, virtual machine that drives three T-Rex machines. These are all very cheap Dells, secondhand, thousand dollar machines or euros, I guess, these days as well. And then there's this lab switch from FS. Uh, you can use any switch, really. And then the rainbow of colors there represent goes down to this device under test that has uh, 18 network cards in it. They're all two or four port uh, Intel cards. Uh, and there's two domains here, if you're nerdy about this, like the PCI buses are driven by each individual CPU, and then the CPUs have interconnectivity between them as well, and so you want to try to keep the network cards on the correct side so that you don't end up using this QPI bus to handle the traffic with the wrong CPU, if that makes sense. All the while we're doing this load test, we're just reading back from T-Rex, from the switch, and from the device under test what it's all seeing, and we're expecting some pretty graphs to show the total traffic. Uh, I cannot undersell the Dell 720 is like a 10-year-old machine and the CPU is nine and a half years old. It is not current, it's slow. Remember that. So in T-Rex, this CLI that I showed kind of looks like this. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff on the, on the page there, but like the NIC info, I'm sending 10 gigs of traffic. How much I've sent in terms of layer one and layer two, like Ethernet uh, throughput, and that difference is really important with small cells. Like if you have 64 byte packets, the overhead of Ethernet, it becomes like very large. How much we got back in number three, and then a bunch of packet counters to see if you know, everything came back in good order. Shown here is a casual load test of about 60 million, 60 packets per second, full line rate on four ports. Uh, and the receiving side sent back 53.6 million packets per second. That's about 36 gigabits of traffic. Uh, so that means because we had four of these uh, ports, one for each CPU thread, that at least in this really simple mode of LX2 cross-connect, uh, it's 13.4 uh, million packets per second per CPU. 
So uh, when you ramp up the traffic on one of these VPP instances, they amort the C CPU DNI cache. Like when you don't have any traffic, CPU is pretty much always doing something different. And you can tell when you see the total amount of clock cycles spent by the CPU per vector, let's say per packet here. On the top left corner here, if I do a, a layer two cross connect at 1000 packets per second, each packet takes 1765 CPU cycles. But if I do 10 million packets per second, it does 173 cycles per packet. So taking a packet from the card through VPP all the way to the other side is 173 CPU cycles. And there are many CPU cycles on a modern CPU, and there's even more CPUs in a modern machine. So I also tested L3 IPv4 forwarding, just normal forwarding, and IPv6 forwarding because that's a little bit more expensive typically. And you can see here, we can do about 9.3 million packets per second on one core with V4 and 8.5 with uh, IPv6. So method two now is this Python script that I wrote that drives these T-Rexes you know, from zero to line rate uh, with a bunch of flags and options. And in the interest of time, I'm just gonna skip over that. But there's a bunch of interesting profiles you can do. When, when people say my router forwards up to uh, 10 gigabits, what they typically do is test like really large frames because there are very few of them in a 10 gig pipe, about 810,000 per second. More realistic is if you use iMix, the internet mix that has some smaller, some medium, and some larger uh, you know, packets. And that's about 3.2 million on a 10 gig uh, port. And then all the way down there on, on number four is just sending the smallest packet we're allowed to send, which is 64 bytes. And you will have seen maybe this magic 14.88 million. That's how you saturate one 10 gig port. And it's particularly insidious, not just for software routers, also for many hardware routers, to use a single flow that always hashes to the same receive queue or to the same port or to the same CPU on the line card. So now here we go. Actually, I'm wondering, is this uh, very good? So unidirectional, one port, one VPP thread. Uh, the time here, the, the graphs on the right, you'll see the, the, there are three sections where I did a load test. Grafana here is showing me the results from T-Rex, so what we're actually getting back out the machine, yes. And the very bottom graph here is how many packets are being handled every time DPDK gives me some which if you don't load the machine is zero, and if you load the machine a lot, maybe, maybe a, l a larger number. So here I just ramped up from zero to 100% of line, uh, which ends up being 9.7 gigabits uh, of uh, ethernet traffic uh, and 10 gigabits of L1. Uh, and of course all the traffic came out fine, because doing 800,000 packets per second is easy, even, I'm not gonna say, even for vendors that are not serious. So then from, uh, from phase two here, I loaded the profile, which looks the same, but the middle graph here shows a larger number, right? So now we're doing three million packets per second at iMix, and again, saturate the whole thing. iMix also has smaller packets, right? So the total L2 line rate that we're going to find is 9.2 gigabits, not 9.7. Uh, and then we try to do a saturation load test with very small packets where we reach about four and a half gigs, and that is not line rate at all. It's about 62 and a half percent of line rate. And at about 8.9 million, you can see at the bottom graph, the amount of vectors shoots through the roof. The CPUs are completely, or the CPU is completely saturated and it can really only uh, forward, you know, about 8.9 or maybe 9 million uh, packets per second on that one thread. But I'm like, wait a minute, this uh, machine has 20 cores. Cool. So let's do this again with six ports. Uh, same thing, really, and I'm not gonna go over it in boring detail, but what you will see here is there's about 54.9 mega packets per second sent, uh, which is 9.15 million per thread, which is almost exactly the same number as what we had originally in that, like 9.31 million, so it's a little bit lower. But at uh, 1,514 bytes of ethernet, I can saturate six ports, no worries, 60 gigs. That is only uh, you know, a couple of million packets per second. Uh, iMix is 3.2 million times six, so it's 18 million packets per second. Again, not a problem. But now I noticed, oh wait, if I do 64 byte, before with one thread it was 62% of line rate, now it's 61.5. And this, this machine has 18 CPUs, so what if I just did 18 of these? There we go. So bi-directional, 18 ports, 18 threads on VPP. Uh, incrementally, you'll see the, the jumps up there. Each individual port that just goes from zero to line rate for that one port 
on the left hand axis and on the right hand axis you'll see the black line at 100 gigabits per second uh, which is reached at 950 uh, and full line rate of 180 uh, gigabits of traffic which is 18 times 10 at 14.7 million packets per second and the amount of vectors per call is super low so this machine is bored. So that kind of proves that it does 100 gigs uh, of traffic, but does it also do my claim of 100 million packs per second? Uh, like spoiler alert, it, it does. And uh, you can see it ramp up here at this 64 or maybe 128 byte uh, load test, uh, you know, three minutes apart, every port just goes and saturates itself. And uh, the orange and green lines there are the thing tracking to uh, completion uh, with 100 million packets per second uh, achieved at about 11 o'clock, which is halfway through the load test, and 151 million packets per second uh, achieved, which is 150 or 149 gigabits per traffic uh, of traffic uh, at uh, around 11.19, and that's where the load test finished. So this machine, uh, happily forwards 150 uh, million packets per second, and it also happily does, obviously, 180 gigs of big traffic. Now, you'll note the graph down below is a little bit busier, like all the threads are actually doing some work, and one of them is really, really upset. Uh, and that's because when I had 18 NICs, I had to split one NIC over two CPUs. So the one CPU was happily on its NUMA domain and the other one wasn't. And so we had to use QPI to get the traffic into the CPU to handle it. And that's why that one, that one CPU thread, poor little, poor little fellow, was not, not very happy. All right, so I got a couple minutes left. Uh, of course, the obvious claim is why do you use 10 gig cards? And the answer is, well, 100 gig cards are expensive. <laughs> and also, they're PCI 4 typically. And so I can't do this on a 10-year-old Dell. I'll need to buy something that does PCI 4. I do have a couple of Mellanox cards and Intel cards. But like to do this properly, I'm going to make another claim. Uh, and that's that next year, I'll do a terabit of traffic uh, and a billion packets per second. But for that, it would be nice if someone had some like epic machines laying around in a data center or you know some like Intel platform Platinums, that could be fantastic. So if you had those and you were willing to have me tinker on them on your premises or ship them to Zurich, that'd be like super, super cool. Until then, uh, here's uh, the rack. Uh, each machine is doing about uh, 260 watts uh, at, this, uh, at this point. So forwarding uh, about 180 gigs of traffic is not the affair of four kilowatts like you might have on your big machines, uh, but merely 260 watts. Uh, this switch here is completely pegged. You can see each port is at 99.9% .9 throughput, which is a nice validation that the traffic is actually going through. Uh, and LibreNMS is showing as well 360 gigs of traffic, which is 180 in and 180 out. And with that, thank you for your time. There's three minutes left for questions. Thank you, Pip, for this awesome talk. And I hand over to the audience for questions. Over there. Hi, uh, Will from LONAP. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, can you say anything? I'm up here. <laughs> can you say anything about um, fib scale? Um, I know you said you could load in seven seconds. How many routes was that? And like, how big a table can you take? Four tables and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Thanks for that. Um, the fib size is unlimited. It's limited by memory on the on the CPU. So in, in my case, the one million in seven seconds is roughly 140,000 routes in the fib per second. The fib doesn't have a TCAM. Uh, it is, of course, true that if your fib becomes sufficiently large that it won't fit in the L3 cache of your CPU, then you may need to use RAM, and that will deteriorate. But modern CPUs have like 55 megs of RAM in the L3 cache, and that will easily hold, I don't know, I'm gonna make a claim like six or eight million uh, in the CPU, uh, right? So without having to use any icky things like RAM. Uh, but there is, no, there is no limit other than how much memory you put on the computer. Great, thank you. Cheers. Next question over here in the left. Oh, <laughs> Hi, so uh, I assume for load testing, you, you basically use two IP addresses, one on that machine, one on the other one. Uh, no, that's, that's an incorrect assumption. The left-hand side is a slash 24, the right-hand side is a slash 24, 
And then on Ethernet, obviously, we just deliver all of the frames to the Ethernet L2 the next hop. Right. And then there's two modes. One would be just literally use one IP address. That'd be single flow. Those are kind of insidious because you only get one receive queue in the NIC. You only get one thread on the VPP. And then the other would be that they, they call it VMVAR2. It doesn't really matter in, in T-Rex language. But it, it actually cycles randomly through the source and or destination uh, IP and or port. So you can make four tuples completely randomized. But uh, what I'm trying to get at is um, if the traffic mix was more diverse for your load test, then because uh, your, your FIP is in memory, and I assume you did one lookup and it resides somewhere in a cache line very close to your CPU, and if the destination addresses for forwarding is more diverse and you have to go back to RAM more often and, and load it closer to your CPU, would those would those numbers change? or would they No, actually the numbers, counterintuitively, I think the numbers go the other direction. So it's not like the IP address is in the, the whole... FIB is in the CPU uh, easily, right? Because like a million in the FIB and you need like 16 bytes per, is like 16 megabytes, right? It's tiny. And so you can put the whole thing in the FIB and because the CPUs are not allowed to run any Linux processes, only VPP, nobody ever uses that cache but me. Uh, spoiler, you have to dedicate the entire computer, of course, to, to this or at least one NUMA CPU, you know? Uh, and so you will have the exact same throughput uh, if you do one flow or a million or 10 million flows to randomize IP addresses, yes. Awesome. The counterintuitive part is if you did randomize IP addresses, you can bound multiple threads to one NIC with four queues, say. And we could see that we could do about nine million packets per second on one core. So if I had two cores, two threads only, I could saturate even 64 bytes on all of these ports, provided that they are sufficiently spread over the two CPUs. All right, thank you. Cheers. Thank you very much, Pim, for this awesome talk. I'll give you a warm applause, please, for Pim.